A spacecraft was lost on the planet Mars more than 50 years ago. Only one short communication was sent home by the probe to Moscow, in the center of the former Soviet Union, before it vanished into a massive dust storm. All that is known about it is that it transmitted back a single, enigmatic picture of the Martian landscape before becoming completely quiet. This is Russia's covert Mars landing. The moon and the first human landing usually take center stage when discussing the space race of the 1960s. However, a much more covert competition was underway to uncover the first scientific details about Mars. We have very little knowledge about our nearest planetary neighbor until now. There were still quite credible hypotheses that suggested there was abundant plant and animal life on Mars, including the creation of man-made water channels by a clever and hard-working Martian populace. Until we traveled there and used our own equipment to conduct close-up investigations of the planet, there was no way to be certain. Twelve attempts at Mars missions were made between 1960 and 1969. Four from the United States and eight by the Soviet Union. Three of them really arrived to the Red Planet undamaged and operational. Everybody was American. In the space race, the Soviet Union had the early lead. They were the first to send a person into space and the first to launch a spacecraft into orbit. Additionally, their Luna probes arrived to the moon's surface first. For the Soviets, accomplishing the first ever flyover and close-up study of Mars would have been another decisive victory. However, this was the point at which America began to gain an advantage in the space race. The Soviet Union's deep space mission, Mars 1, came agonizingly close to success in 1962 after two unsuccessful attempts in 1960. Although it wasn't their first effort, the Soviet authorities had a nasty habit of renaming unsuccessful missions and acting as if they never occurred in order to justify trying again. This specific Mars 1 really broke beyond Earth's orbit and was on a victorious trajectory for a flyby of Mars that would bring it within 11,000 kilometers of the planet's surface. For around four months, everything was in perfect condition. Up until the spacecraft became quiet and was never heard from again, some 106 million kilometers from Earth. NASA had taken the lead in space exploration by the middle of the 1960s with Mariner 4. This mission conducted the first ever close flyby of Mars in July 1965. A little more over 6,000 kilometers above Earth. Amazingly for its time, Mariner 4 took the first comprehensive photos of the Martian terrain. Sadly, what the images showed was a lifeless, cratered planet that resembled our own moon more in terms of redness. Nothing at all, no canals, no trees, no traces of life. That took away some of the excitement. However, it was evident that human infatuation with Mars continued. As everyone knows, NASA won the space race when they made their moon landing in the summer of 1969. However, the Soviet Union had one more chance to shine. Their goal was to get to Mars before anybody else did. The year 1971 was significant for Mars exploration. We know that around every two years, Earth and Mars pass quite near to one another in their orbits around the Sun. However, there is a much closer alignment than typical between the two planets every 15 to 17 years. The US and Soviet space programs were keen to take advantage of this planet-wide occurrence. NASA was a self-confident organization. The American goal was to attempt the first stable orbit around Mars after Mariner 4, 6, and 7 had successfully completed their flyby operations. They may then survey the planet's surface and investigate the upper atmosphere to conduct a long-term observation of the whole thing. This crucial information was needed for NASA's first effort to set foot in the Soviet Union. They had decided to go straight for a safe landing on the surface of Mars, skipping one stage in the process. Three missions were to be sent out in quick succession. Initially, a reconnaissance orbiter named Mars 71s would get the same data that the Americans sought, since you would basically be entering the area blindly without measuring the atmosphere and taking pictures of the surface. The twin landing vehicles, dubbed Mars 2 and Mars 3, would trail the orbiter. The plan was for the landing profile to be dynamically updated by Soviet engineers using information gathered in orbit. This was, in principle, a brilliant concept. In actuality, a simple but deadly programming mistake caused the Soviet Mars spacecraft to crash in space. 
One and a half hours into the flight, the fourth stage engine was scheduled to ignite. Rather, a 150-hour internal timer was configured. The Soviets then dubbed the probe Cosmos 419 and lied that it was simply another observation satellite that was meant to be there once it became permanently lodged in Earth's orbit. Even though Moscow knew they were going into this blind, they decided to try a landing when its reconnaissance orbiter went down in space. NASA was also making some progress toward Mars, but not much. Instead of traveling into orbit, their first probe, Mariner 8, plummeted down to Earth after a launch failure. However, Mariner 9, its identical twin orbiter, had much more success. As the first artificially created spacecraft to circle Mars, Mariner 9 managed to escape ahead of the Soviet expedition. After entering an elliptical orbit, the probe approached as near as 1400. Martian terrain's six scientific instruments were carried by Mariner 9, one of which was a visual imaging system with a resolution of 98 meters per pixel, an improvement above the 790 meters per pixel of earlier flybys of Mars. This occurred two weeks before to the Soviet Union's Mars 2 and Mars 3 landers arriving. Naturally, the United States of America has no interest in disclosing any of their Mariner 9 data. They refused to even warn the Russians of the impending storm. Both Mars 2 and Mars 3 were the same spacecraft, with an orbital module and a descent module in each. The newly lighter orbital module was supposed to use an engine to slow down and lift itself into a stable orbit of Mars, where it might function as a temporary observation satellite after dropping the lander. The first to arrive was Mars 2. With no other option, the Soviets attempted an uncontrolled ballistic entry, which meant that the lander would enter the atmosphere like a bullet and we would have to let destiny take its course. The forces of gravity, atmospheric drag, and the probe's aerodynamics will decide the ultimate trajectory and landing spot. The principal aero-braking mechanism was a 2.9-meter diameter heat shield located on the descent module. This should lower the velocity to little over 1 km second, or 3.5 times the speed of sound, from around 6 km second upon arrival. Regretfully, the descent module of Mars 2 approached at an excessively acute angle. The landing mechanism was never activated because the onboard computer misread the altimeter data. Even so, Mars 2's collision with the Red Planet was the first artificial object to do so. When Mars 3 finally arrives on December 2, 1971, the Soviets will have had a chance to reflect on their past blunders. They execute the assault angle flawlessly this time. The descent module approaches the Martian atmosphere for four and a half hours after being lowered from the orbiter. Once again, the heat shield starts the aero-braking mechanism and provides protection during entrance. As the car descends to the ground, the rate of fall is determined using a radio altimeter. The supersonic parachutes are deployed when the aircraft achieves its final velocity of Mach 3.5. Remember that this is the first parachute deployment on Mars history. Nobody, especially the Soviets, really understood what was going to happen. However, it worked this time. The descent module is slowing down, but it will never slow down sufficiently because of the thin Martian atmosphere. Therefore, the module has retro rockets powered by gunpowder that shoot in the last seconds to slow down the spacecraft's velocity and release the landing capsule a few meters above the ground. The egg-shaped capsule descends to the surface, and the rockets shove what's left of the descent module and parachute away. Although the lander hits the ground forcefully, a substantial layer of foam cushions the impact. The whole system, including the shock absorber, retro rockets, parachutes, and aero shield, is almost exactly the same as the one NASA will employ for all of its landings on Mars. Although NASA has evolved throughout time, the fundamental idea has remained the same. And the Soviet Union accomplished this in 1971, five years before to NASA's Mars landing. The Mars 3 landing capsule released its four triangle pedals to self-right and reveal its suite of scientific equipment after hitting the surface and coming to a stop. The lander included sensors for temperature, pressure, and wind speed in addition to a mass spectrometer for studying the composition of the atmosphere. Even a mechanical scoop to look for organic materials and living things on the ground. Just in case this wasn't remarkable enough, Mars 3 also had a small rover on board called the Prop-M.
At about 21 centimeters long and 16 centimeters broad, it resembled a little metal box. It had no wheels and weight for and a half props. It stepped forward gently by using a pair of broad, flat skis that were attached on arms. The rover was connected to a 15-meter power line to the primary lander. Its objective was to test the density of Martian soil using a tiny onboard probe. It is important to emphasize once again that, despite having very little prior understanding of the Martian environment, all of this equipment successfully made it from Kazakhstan to the planet's surface on the second try. 90 seconds after landing, the Mars 3 lander had turned on its equipment and started transmitting data back to Moscow before it was launched in 1971. This was a historic win for the Soviet Union, but it was soon followed by a historic setback. Only 14 seconds had passed before Mars's signal began to fade. This jumbled black and white picture was the sole data that was sent. The Soviets' decision to keep their landing on Mars a secret and not even to disclose the image was such a huge letdown. In the eyes of many, the whole affair was just another setback in a growing list of space exploration disasters. For many years, the Mars landing was mostly kept under wraps. However, once the Soviet Union collapsed, its documents were declassified. What then became of Mars 3? The regular dust storms on Mars tend to merge every five years or so to create a single superstorm that covers the whole planet's surface, without the orbiter for reconnaissance to study the surroundings. Unbeknownst to the Soviet engineers back home, their landers were arriving on Mars at the most inopportune moment. Because Mars' atmosphere is so thin, the storm's physical force is negligible, therefore wind isn't even an issue. Just the dust is present. Electrostatic particles that stick to surfaces a lot are present in Martian dust. That is now known to us. However, those constructing the Mars capsule in 1970 did not. Therefore, there was no defense against the dust. All of the lander's exposed systems would have been swiftly shorted out, preventing it from achieving any scientific objectives. To exacerbate matters, the Mars 2 and 3 orbital modules which both succeeded in entering orbit around the planet, were unable to return any meaningful images either, as all they were able to see was the apex of the planet's massive dust storm, rather than any fine details of the Martian surface. The far better equipped Mariner 9 managed to weather the storm in the meanwhile, and over the course of the next three months, they mapped out over 70 of the planet's surface, discovering landmarks like Olympus Mons, the solar system's largest peak. Regarding the whereabouts of the Mars 3 lander, NASA published a very high-resolution photograph from its Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in the early 2000s, including 1 billion pixels. It was assumed that the remnants of the Soviet lander were somewhere in the picture based on the final known trajectory. On the surface of Mars in 2013, researchers found what they thought to be the lander and parachute heat shield.